is Joanna Hemlock, and I'm incredibly pleased and excited to present a few adventures of Dick Rogers, Space Detective. Tonight, before we get into the entertainment, I should give a little backstory on how my colleagues and I uncovered this lost gem. Every year in December, the Greater Second Episcopal Church here in Cleveland hosts a rummage sale to raise money for families in the area that need some financial support during the holidays. I've been going to that sale for the last four years because they always have an interesting selection of old media. From 78 records and acetates to home recordings on reel-to-reel -reel tape, there's always something interesting to discover. In December of 2019, I made a discovery that I just had to share with the other members of the Northeast Radio Drama Society, or NERDS for short. We are a group of actual nerds dedicated to discovering, sharing, and preserving audio recordings that might otherwise have been destined for the landfill and lost forever. That day, I came across a few reels of tape marked Dick Rogers, Space Detective. And with a label like that, there was no way I was leaving without them. When I got home, they unfortunately ended up in a pile with some other tapes that I had meant to go through, and there they stayed until one fateful Tuesday in May during quarantine when I was working my way through the backlog. I threaded a reel into my Ampex ATR 700, pressed play, and out came... Inhabitants of Neptune, we have come in peace merely to investigate a distress call from the scientific outpost orbiting your planet. We came to your planet with no knowledge of your existence and wish to move forward in a spirit of cooperation and friendship. Now, I'll admit, not the best audio quality, but this was taped off the radio many years ago, and time has done a number on the tape stock itself. But I was hooked. After listening through a few episodes, I knew I had to share the adventures of Dick Rogers with as many people as possible. I was afraid the audio quality would discourage listening, but after some transcribing and digging with some other nerds, we were able to come up with some scripts, which we will re-dramatize for you here tonight. But I'm getting ahead of myself. The first episode of The Adventures of Dick Rogers, Space Detective, a mystery in, of the empty planet, aired on KRAQ in Toledo on Wednesday, September 22nd, 1937 at 4.30 p.m. The whole project was spearheaded by John Orville, who had recently taken over as programming manager. He asked, Steffel, uh, <laughs> excuse me, he asked staff writer Cecil Thurston to write a science fiction or detective program to fill a hole in their broadcast schedule. Cecil misheard the instructions and the rest is history, or could have been history, if the show had ever caught on in a wider market. But even with the quite modest local distribution, the show ran for an impressive 52 years on stations in northern Ohio until WPUN 1490 in Cleveland was bought out by Clear Channel in 1989. In that time, the titular character was voiced by over two dozen actors, and dozens of writers took the series in as many different directions as you could possibly imagine. The history and minutiae of the series are absolutely fascinating. At least they are to my colleagues and I and nerds. Most of you, on the other hand, are most likely here for the <clears throat> adventures, daring tales of adventures and suspense. So I'll tell the rest of the story on my podcast, Cup of Hemlock, and we'll get on with the show. <laughs> Our first adventure of the night, Fury of the Frogmen, was originally broadcast on July 16, 1941. This episode was the first on the tape that introduced me to Dick Rogers. The beginning of a three-part story, Dick Rogers vs. the Frogmen from Neptune, written by Larry Hancher. I debated including this story tonight, since we aren't able to follow up with the subsequent episodes of the trilogy at this point, but since this was the story that hooked me on Dick Rogers, I just couldn't resist. We transcribed the episode from the recording, advertisements and all, but we have been a bit gender blind when it comes to casting, so don't let that throw you off. If you're scientifically inclined, you'll probably notice a ton of inaccuracies regarding speeds of travel, planet composition, and other faux pas. Still, 
I think these liberties add to the charm of a series that always had more heart and imagination than budget or fact checking. Anyway, I hope you enjoy Fury of the Frogmen. A distress call from the scientific outpost orbiting the huge aquatic globe of Neptune. Emergency! Stop! We are under attack! Stop! It came from the planet! Stop! Send help! We won't last much longer! Stop! I repeat, we are under attack! Stop! Please send help! Stop! Dear listener, you know that when danger calls, there is only one man the Galactic Investigative Force would send. These are the adventures of Dick Rogers, Space Detective. This week we present the first of a three-part series, Dick Rogers vs. the Frogmen of Neptune. Tonight's episode, Fury of the Frogmen. Brought to you by our sponsor, Pitman Flooring. When was the last time you really looked at the floors in your house? Chances are your wife looks at them every day. If your house still has old-fashioned wood floors, chances are she's as tired of looking at them as she is of trying to sweep around all the scratches, warping, and cracks. What if I told you that the professionals at Pittman Flooring could cover those unsightly wooden floors with modern and durable linoleum for a fraction of the cost of sanding and finishing and in a fraction of the time? Looking for something a little warmer and more luxurious? How about sumptuous wall-to-wall carpeting? Don't settle for outdated floors any longer. Just stop in at the showroom on Elm Street to speak with a salesman who can help you make a plan to modernize and revolutionize your home flooring. And now we rejoin our intrepid adventurers as they blast through the ether at unimaginable speed. What is our ETA, Professor? Our trajectory should intercept the orbit of the outpost at 0900 hours. Do we have radio contact, Leslie? We do, Dick. The distress beacon seems to be set to automatic. I can't raise anyone on the voice channel. The schematics provided by the GIF say the outpost only has a one-channel radio, so that's hardly. Dick, I'm picking up some chatter on another frequency. What are they saying? I can't make any sense of it. But Leslie, darling, you're fluent in every major language humans speak. That's just it, Father. I don't think they're human. As the huge blue orb grew in the forward window, the crew mulled over the possibility of contact with a new race of violent, barbaric aliens. They raced to pack up their investigative equipment and donned their bulky oxygen suits. Soon the cool blue disc filled their view, and as they drew closer the, to the as they drew closer, the outpost became visible. Where their rocket ship, the Gladys, was long, sleek, and graceful. The outpost was a bulky jumble of modules and containers, the surface studded with all manner of sensors and scientific apparatus. We'll be ready to dock in two minutes. Anything new on the radio, Leslie? It sounds like a fairly short, repeated message. I transmitted some audio samples back to the Mars station. Maybe the mainframe there can help with translation. But with the three-hour transmission delay, we'll be waiting a while before we know what they're saying. I hope I can get back to work on my miniature computer soon. If I succeed... We'll be able to house a mainframe nearly as powerful as the one on the Mars station in a room only seven feet on a side, weighing less than 3,000 pounds. It'll still be too bulky for a rocket ship like this, though we can put on some on other outposts throughout the solar system. Keep dreaming, Professor. Next you'll tell me you're working on a computer that will fit on a desktop. <laughs> oh, don't be silly, Dick. The desk would have to be made for a reinforced steel to even support something like that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you two, let's get serious. We're headed into an unknown situation on an outpost we have no radio contact with, orbiting a giant ball of water seven million miles from the nearest permanent settlement with involvement of an unknown hostile alien race. Rowing a floor show and some rye whiskey, and it sounds like a heck of a Friday night. <laughs> well, maybe next time we duck. The two of us can take in a floor show and maybe... Now's no time for making social plans. You're right, Professor. Let's get things buttoned up for docking. Leslie, can you help me with my helmet? As long as you help me with mine. Dad says this suit is fine, but I think it's getting a little small, especially the helmet. I see what you mean. The helmet barely fits. As for the suit, I think it really flatters your figure. I'd like to get one that's not so tight, but if... You like it. Don't you have a rocket ship to dock, Dick? I can help my own child into a suit. Child? I'll 
be 17 in a couple months. You're right about the docking, Professor. I'll get right on it. Picture, if you will, the gleaming silver 50-foot-long rocket ship. Watch with your mind's eye as Dick ably coaxes it into alignment with the bulky, blocky science outpost. Then imagine the delicate precision it takes to get the airlock opening halfway down its length lined up with the corresponding opening of the outpost. All the while fighting the gravity of the planet trying to pull you away into greater da danger. And you thought parallel parking your Studebaker was difficult. Luckily, our intrepid hero has the nerve, the grit, and the skill to make such a heroic feat a mundane task. We're locked on. I'm about to cycle the airlock. Make sure you double-check the pressure gauges. Who knows if the outpost is still pressurized? We'll know in a minute. Here, I'll take that equipment case for you. Thank you, Dick. The pressure is bottomed out. No atmosphere at all. Double check your suit seals. Good to know. Now, Leslie, we don't know what we're walking into here. Whatever alien creature launched this cowardly attack against a defenseless science outpost may still be aboard. We'll all have our laser rays out and charged, but try and stay behind me and your father. If anything ambushes us, I want it to be one of us who draws their attack. I don't know what I would do if anything happened to you. Oh, Dick, you're so brave. What about your dear old dad? Oh, father, you know I think the world of you both. Our three daring pathfinders crowded into the airlock, a tiny antechamber between the two ships, barely larger than two phone booths put together. They attempt to make a safe transition to the stricken science outpost. As the air hissed back out of the airlock into the Gladys, they could only wait in tense anticipation of what lay on the other side of the solid steel hatch door. Were they walking into an ambush, a gruesome scene of bloody carnage, as they steel themselves to deal with what they will encounter? Let's have a word from Pittman Flooring. Like many of you, I like to care for my house. A couple years ago, I noticed that the wood floor in my entrance hall and living room had become very scuffed and scratched. Also, like many of you, I didn't have the free time to sand and varnish the floor myself. So I hired workers to do that for me. I ended up with a huge bill and floors that only two years later were already starting to look scuffed and scratched. I decided to do something about it and had the skilled professionals at Pittman Flooring install an easy to clean, durable, and stylish linoleum throughout the whole house. My wife and I have never been happier and never been happier with our floors. And I'm sure if you have Pittman flooring cover up those ugly wooden floors, you'll be just as happy. So stop on down to Pittman flooring today. And now, as the door hisses open, we rejoin those daring doers as they venture into the unknown. Okay, the airlock pressure is equalized. Let's move in and keep our eyes peeled. What do you see? There's a lot of smoke. Can you see anything, Professor? Activating suit light. Wait, is that smoke or steam? You might be right. There's water everywhere. Maybe that's why the atmosphere is off. Maybe the water shorted the system. Careful, boys. You don't want to get shocked if there's still current flowing. Don't worry. I've got rubber soles. I guess they don't call you space detectives gumshoes for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, be careful anyway, Dick. I don't want either of you bantering too much to hear an ambush if we run into one. As these valiant seekers carefully moved forward into, into the dim, hazy room ahead, they used the lights on their suits to peer into the shadowy enigmas that lay before them. They moved methodically, illuminating their mysterious surroundings a bit at a time. It's clear over here. Are you two finding anything out of the ordinary? Nothing here. The gauge cluster here might still be working. It looks like they've got a map of the ship with pressure gauges for each section. If I'm reading this correctly, it looks like this section and the two nearest it are depressurized, but most of the rest of the outpost is still holding air. Oh look, a gauge cluster! Leslie, move out of the way and let me take a look at that. Leslie, keep that light still. I'm trying, Father. What do you see, Professor? It looks like they've got a map of the ship with pressure gauges for each section. If I'm reading this correctly... Looks like the pressure gauge for this section is bottomed out, and a couple near us, but most of the rest of the outpost is still holding air. 
It looks like one of those is the generator room. If they lost atmosphere there, it would make sense that the power is out. Because coal can't burn without oxygen. Not that you're listening. <laughs> Which makes sense, since coal can't burn without oxygen. Yep. And the coal hopper unit is depressurized as well. But it looks like most of the rest of the station at least has air. Whether or not it would be breathable without the power to circulate in the oxygen renewal unit is yet to be seen. So, the airlock and minor utility units don't have atmosphere, but the rest of the outpost does. Sounds like a prion strike to me. That goes a long way confirming that these Neptunians might be intelligent. But how would they have known which sections to target? Well, maybe they worked out how to translate English and picked up clues from monitoring radio traffic. You're the language expert. Do you think that's feasible? That's ridiculous. The outpost has only been operating for a few months. There's no way they could have deciphered English within that amount of time. Maybe they have a translation computer like the ones we've got on Mars and Earth. Now, Leslie, surely you remember that there aren't any landmasses on the planet. Do you mean to tell me you think they've invented a computer that works while submerged in water? Well, they could have any sort of structure under the water there. Maybe they have... I'll be interested in the specifics once we've explored more of the outpost and figured out if the scientists who are stationed here are alive and safe. For now, we'll have to keep our curiosity at bay and keep investigating. You're right. Of course, Dick. In perfect agreement, our valiant venturers continued their search of the outpost, along the way encountering the dastardly deeds of these unlo unknown alien antagonists. How could they have torn through the whole of the outpost like that? It's made of three-inch thick steel. From the drips and beads of metal around the breach, it looks like they burned their way in with some sort of high-intensity laser. If they have a laser that powerful, I sure hope they don't still have it pointed at us in our direction. They could vaporize us in a heartbeat. Dear Leslie, try not to worry. I'm sure we'd be able to see it if it was within range here. There's no way it could be powerful enough to do this kind of damage from the planet. Besides, the very idea of an underwater laser is utterly preposterous. The contrast between the ragged, horrifying gash in the wall of the generator room and the cool beauty of the cerulean orb revealed by the light of the distant sun was shocking. But there was no time to admire the view while the malicious deeds of these unrevealed foes of humanity remained to be investigated. Our stalwart Crusaders for Truth continued their meticulous search of the outpost in the mess hall. Look at how the food was just left on the table. Those fiendish Neptunians must have swept through here and simply hauled all of the crew out. How many crew members were there? The brief from Jip was 20 crewmen. And they've all disappeared, nearly without a trace. Here, on the wall. Could this be a laser burn? No, Leslie. That's clearly a laser burn from when the crew was being kidnapped. But that's what I... Clearly these Neptunians are an incredibly violent species to attack a peaceful science mission like this. Well, we'll just have to be extra careful. Keep your eyes peeled and your ears open, just in case some of them are still around somewhere. They continued to work their way through laboratories, crew quarters, and every other environment on their way to the command bridge. Dick! The gauges on the bulkhead door into the bridge are showing not only pressure and oxygen, but emergency backup power. That must be what is keeping the emergency beacon broadcasting. We'll have to be careful entering. It could be that there are one or more crewmen holed up in there, with weapons trained on the hatch, in case the aliens come back. Or those monsters could have left a trap in there, knowing any investigation would have to come to this section. Leslie, you stay back for right now. I'll stay behind Dick. All right, Professor. I'll turn the hatch wheel and swing it open. You keep your blaster trained on the opening, but don't fire unless you see something that isn't human. On the count of three... One... Two... Three! What lies behind the dread portal of fate? Enemies? Allies? A nefarious trap? Unfortunately, we'll have to keep you, dear listeners, in suspense for just a moment while we have another word from our sponsor. What could be worse than getting out of your bed on a chilly winter's morning and stepping onto the cold, uncomfortable wooden floor? 
Now I know you can keep your slippers handy or buy an expensive wool rug to avoid that discomfort, but there is another option. Head over to the Pittman Flooring Showroom on Elm Street and browse their selection of premium wall-to-wall carpet made out of revolutionary nylon fiber. You simply won't believe the comfort and luxury these carpets can provide at pennies on the dollar that you would have had to spend on wool rugs. You can say goodbye to those torturous wooden floors and your slippers and sink your toes into the sheer luxury available from Pittman Flooring. And now we rejoin our fearless investigators as they peer into the unknown. Professor, what do you see? The room looks empty. It's nice to have the overhead lights on after all this darkness. I think we can move in if we go carefully. Can we close the hatch behind us and get these helmets off? They're so heavy. If you'll stay out here for a moment, Leslie, your father and I will make a quick sweep of the room. And if everything seems safe, we'll do just that. I'm sure we'd all love to get that weight off our shoulders. And after a quick sweep of the room, they all entered the bridge, closed up after themselves, and doffed their helmets. <sighs> it's always nice to get out of that fishbowl, even if it's only for a short break. I agree, even though I'm sure my hair is an absolute disaster. This is an investigation, not a debutante ball. Who are you trying to impress? I'm sure we can overlook the hideous state of your hair for the moment. Oh, <laughs> Leslie! Even the worst hair in the world couldn't possibly diminish your... Ooh, uh, I mean, looks fine. We'll just have to finish up in here and you can get back to the ship and get things back under control. Maybe I'll just head back now. If they were able to translate the radio signals from the planet, we should be getting a broadcast back from Mars pretty soon. I'll go and get set up to receive. That's the... First good idea you've had today. Be careful, Leslie. I'll keep my comms on so you can let us know if you see anything on the way back to the rocket. I will. And I'll open a channel from the Gladys once the transmission from Mars starts so you can hear it too. She needs to have a helmet with enough room inside to keep a respectable hairstyle. We'll have to get her an adult-sized suit next time we dock. But she's so young. Why would she need an adult size? Professor! She's almost 17 years old. She's a full-grown woman. Uh, in fact, there's something I've been meaning to speak with you about. Oh, Dick, you know Leslie will always be my precious little girl, and if you ever... Wait! What's that stuck under the cushion here? Some spare change? It's a book! What kind of book? The Captain's Logbook. Does it say anything about the attack? Let's see. Here it is. June 20th. Year 1997. Last night, I was called away from a briefing about our sonar sweeps of the planet to the bridge by communications officer Collins. He wanted me to listen to radio broadcasts we had intercepted from the planet, but couldn't understand their heathen lingo. But the tone of voice seemed agitated. I told him to make audio recordings to transmit them back to the Mars base in hopes the computer there could make translations. Here's the recorder. I'm going to play back a little to see if it sounds like what we picked up on the way here. The radio chatter stopped as soon as you pressed record. Is that supposed to happen? It must not be set up to keep sending audio to the speakers after it's recording. I'll switch it off and see if I can correct that. It stopped again. Do you even know if we're getting anything recorded? The needle is moving on the VU meter. I think it should be working, but I guess I can stop the recording and play it back just to make sure we... That can't be right. That's the whole recording. They must have had it set up to record from the microphone instead of the receiver. You've guessed it in one, Professor. Listen to this. It seems the recording circuit had somehow been patched into our microphones. But not only that, it had switched the radio into broadcast mode. After we switched off the recorder, a voice came through. And though unintelligible, seemed harsh. Then, the frequency shut down. I had Colin shut down all of the comm channels in the outpost, and we continued to monitor transmissions from the planet. Almost two hours later, we started receiving another direct broadcast from the planet. It was in a computerized voice, like you'd hear from a translation program used on one of our mainframes back home. Leslie was right. They do have an aquatic computer. The message was as follows. Unknown object in orbit. 
We have observed your invasion of our planetary space, and we were willing to wait for you to make contact. But your use of sonic weaponry against us has forced us to take a less peaceful stance. State your purpose for being here, or we will be forced to respond to your attacks with violence. We will monitor this frequency, and if you do not respond within eight hours, our attack will commence. And then they just waited out the clock until the laser killed their generator module? Your GIF scientists are such cowards. Wait! Listen to this. I wanted to radio GIF to see how they thought we should proceed, thinking we had plenty of time to figure out what message to send home. After only one hour, we had another transmission from the planet, saying that roughly our time was up, and they would be attacking in four hours. The attack came 30 minutes later, with an energy beam directly from the planet. The translation program must not have been able to directly convert units of time accurately. Not that surprising, considering the differences in both culture and length of orbit of the planet. Dick, the transmission from Mars base is coming in. I'll patch it through. Thank you, Leslie. We've got some things to get you caught up on after that. Sounds good. The transmission should be coming through. Unknown vehicle approaching Neptune. We are aware that you are responding to a distress signal sent from the craft which has invaded our planetary orbit. If you do not respond on this frequency in 32 hours, we will be forced to attack. Message repeats. If our translation program has the same problems as the Neptunians, we most likely have less than an hour to respond. What do you mean? We'll fill you in once we get back to the Gladys. Professor, let's get our helmets on and get back. Leslie, we'll be there to explain in a few minutes. Get the airlock prepped for us. Yes, Father. With the clock ticking, can our unflinching posse defuse the situation before a laser burns them out of orbit? As Dick and the Professor hurry back to the Gladys, we have another message from our sponsor. I'll never forget the feeling I had one day after walking into my living room and hearing my son sobbing in pain. I asked Jimmy what was the matter, and he choked out around his sobs that he had come in from a game of stickball and, as his mother had asked, taken off his dirty shoes. But when he entered the living room, he had gotten a splinter from the dated, rough, uncomfortable wooden floor. I did my best to get the little ninny to stop crying and advised him that the best thing to do would be to walk off the pain. Little did I know that that wound caused by that very splinter would later become infected and lead to a foot being amputated. <laughs> now don't worry, I have two sons who aren't constant disappointments. But if I had gone to Pittman flooring sooner, I could have avoided the whole inconvenience. So if you have wooden floors like I used to, stop in at Pittman Flooring on Elm Street and speak with them about covering up those ugly, outdated wooden floors today. And now we return for the thrilling conclusion of tonight's tale. The lads gave Leslie the scoop, and once they made it back to the Gladys, and they started, they are starting to formulate a plan. We need to send a message down to the planet and quick. But what should it be? I say, we send a message asking for coordinates to land and come in guns blazing. Blow those evil monsters into next Thursday. Judging by the damage to the outpost here, I don't think they'd have much trouble burning us out of the sky before we could do much damage. You're right, Leslie. We'll have to be diplomatic and hope this is another predicament we can talk our way out of. If there's a man for that job, it's definitely you, Dick. Ever since you managed to talk my father out of his evil ways, I believe you can get us out of any jam we find ourselves in. You're right, Leslie. The man who made me see the error of my ways is certainly the right man for the job. If you two are convinced, Leslie, set the radio to broadcast. Right away, Dick. And mere moments later, the voice of Dick Rogers, space detective, was thundering down to the inhabitants of Neptune. People of Neptune. Creatures. Inhabitants of Neptune. We have come merely to investigate a distress call from the scientific outpost orbiting your planet. We came to your planet with no knowledge of your existence and wish to move forward in a spirit of cooperation and friendship. You will tell us the whereabouts of our fellow Earthlings and negotiate for their release, or the might of the gift will descend on you like the hammer of the gods, or whatever the equivalent of a god might exist on this backward ball of water! 
Now we just have to wait for their response. That was really great, Dick. I'm sure we'll be on our way back to the gift base in no time. And in a matter of minutes, they had their response. We will send a delegation to your location to negotiate. Expect our arrival in four hours. That means we have 30 minutes. We have scanned your vessel, and if we detect any activity in your weapon systems, you will not survive long enough to launch any attack. Now we just have to wait. Oh, Dick, what do you think they'll look like? Unknown beings from an unknown planet? They could look like anything. Don't worry, dear. If they're too gruesome, I'm sure you could go into your quarters. In 30 minutes on the dot, there was the sound of knocking from the airlock door. Professor Willis went to run the airlock through its cycle. Then, as the hatch swung open... Oh, dear! In walked the Neptunian delegation. Leslie nearly fainted at the sight of the seven-foot-tall frogmen carrying menacing laser rifles. As no less than eight heavily armed monsters trooped into the room, they formed two lines upon which separating revealed a more richly costume example of the species. Though not so tall or broad as the guards which preceded him, he still advanced confidently into the chamber. On his wrist, he wore a device with what looked like a miniature speaker, only four inches across. He held it up to his inhuman mouth and began to speak. <laughs> Soon after, the translation program started to translate nearly in real time. You will accompany us back to the planet to negotiate for your lives and the lives of your compatriots, or you will die. Can Dick talk his way out of this predicament? Will the frogmen exterminate mankind? Will Dick and Leslie finally wind up together? To find out, you'll have to join us next week for the next adventure of Dick Rogers, Space Detective. Brought to you by Pittman Flooring. You'll never have to suffer the agony of walking on wooden floors again after a visit from the skilled professionals at Pittman Flooring. <laughs>